There's so many things I would like to <clears throat> say to you tonight. And I'm going to reserve some personal remarks for just a couple of moments after the singing of the invitation song tonight. If I start down that road right now, I won't be able to preach. When you have been participating in a long journey with others who share with you common faith, common conviction, common hope, after the passing of 44, 45 years. <clears throat> there are just a few basic things that rise to the top that you begin to understand <clears throat> in a way that, though perhaps when you were younger you said the words, you read the text. It just, it just did not resonate the same. Now we know. The words of the preacher, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. I understand that to mean in part There is the passing of the generations. There is the coming forth of the next generation. Life goes on. The sun rises. The sun goes down. It hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, it goes around to the north, around and around goes the wind on its circuits, the wind returns. All the streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what shall be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Tonight in closing, I, I would like to just share very briefly with you three or four very fundamental life lessons. that the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes had discovered long ago. First of all, there, there is a sense in which all of us have come to understand that life 
is unpredictable. My future is unpredictable. The wind blows from one direction, and just when you think that's the way it's going to be, it flo- the wind is blowing from another direction. And then just when you get acclimated to the wind coming from that direction, it turns and it goes again. And there is a real sense in which we come to realize that what, what is lying before us is absolutely unpredictable. We, we spend a lot of time saying to one another in, in moments of tragedy, in, in moments of surprise, in, in moments of shock, in, in moments of joy. We spend a lot of time saying, well, I'll tell you one thing, I didn't see that coming. There's a lot of real life that affects us to our core that we didn't see coming. One one of those things, as we spoke of the other night, one of those challenges, perhaps, that has come, something that was given to us, not chosen by us, but now it's ours to deal with. It is true, we don't know what the morrow will bring. One thing we do know, the writer of Ecclesiastes reminds us tonight, however your life may be at this moment, no one knows, and you surely don't know exactly what the future holds, but one thing is for sure, things will change. Because things change, and circumstances change. And people change. And my life changes. As we live life coming together, the writer of Ecclesiastes is going to remind us, in so many words, he's going to remind us that as we bask in the blessings that God has poured out on us abundantly, there is something to be said for savoring the moment that God has given us to eat, drink, and, and, and enjoy the blessings that God has brought to us. We have royally feasted together spiritually in these last few days. What a wonderful thing. What a joy. What a blessing. No one knows what the future holds. I'll tell you, if you have any doubts about that, especially, especially all of you older people like Mark Cochran, who was up introducing me, and, and, and reminding all of us <clears throat> who are old that we've made this journey together. And we've shared the really good times and we've shared some bad times. We have, we have been basking together in the sunshine of God's blessings and His glory and His love and we have at times walked with one another in a very true sense through the valley of the shadow of death. I can tell you something. When all of that began, there were not any of us who are here tonight who could have predicted that our lives were going to be exactly as they are right now these 44 years later. A 
Life is not always going to be the way it is today. Our, our future is unpredictable. And let me say to you, it, it is a reminder for everyone here, young and old, that we need to be living in the moment that God has given us right now. And do not presume nor take for granted that you know what, what tomorrow is going to be like. The second thing that we are reminded of is that in life, <clears throat> as we have lived, there's no one of us who have all the answers. But we're here tonight bowing our knees and lifting our voices in praise to the one who does. That's the point. After my problems over a year ago, I canceled all my meetings, except this one. I really I really came to Bowling Green 44 years ago with a lot more answers. By the grace of God in the passing of the years, he's given me the opportunity to understand that I really didn't know nearly, nearly what I thought I did. The prophet said a long time ago, The way of man is not in himself. And the writer of Proverbs said, it's the glory of God to conceal things. The apostle Paul said, one of the telltale signs of a people without God is that they think they are wise. They think they know. And he said in Romans 1 that professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul was reminding those Christians in Corinth that God had taken the wisdom of the world and shamed it with true wisdom. One of the values of being part of a community of faith is that we have the opportunity to share together, Uh, not just in worship and, and not just in fun, but in learning, in studying, in growing, in finding answers to some of the challenges and the 
difficulties of life as they come to us in various stages of life. And one of the things that God, in His mercy, He helps us to understand sometimes as He gently brings us to humility and sometimes as He takes a two-by-four and He slaps us down. But God helps us understand that in this life, as we're dealing with the realities that are inherent in life under the sun, in this life, the answers that we so desperately need and those answers that we earnestly seek are answers that are found in Him and in His Word. And we spend a lifetime with one another trying to help each other find that. If you haven't learned this already, if God grants you enough years, you're going to find out. Life is fragile and so are are old bones. Life is very fragile. One of, the, one of the characteristics of youth is that <clears throat> generally speaking, young people, though everyone acknowledges that they're going to die, n- no one actually thinks it's going to happen, at least not anytime soon. Life is fragile, folks. And it's fragile in many ways. Did you hear the words of the preacher when he said, a generation goes and a generation remains and life goes on. But that's not all he said. He said, lest our ego and our pride is hindering our spiritual development as we should be becoming more and more like Jesus, if our ego and pride is getting in the way of that. We need to remember something that the... Life is fragile, and there's a generation that passes. And in verse 11, he said, And there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. One of the, one of the great joys of this week has been reminiscing <clears throat> Reminiscing with the old people. That's fun for old people. We, we like to reminisce. We, we like to think about those memories that we have of the days gone by and, and, and the good times and the people that were so much a part of our lives. I want to tell you, one of the most arresting realities of coming back to a place 44 years after you arrived there the first time is that a lot of the main characters of the scene have passed. And we miss them. We miss them because they were part of our lives. We we miss them because they made a difference for us. We 
We miss them because they help make us into the people that we are. And one of the things we know is as we talk about them, and one of the reasons we talk about them is because many of you didn't know them. You're too young. Well, of course you're not going to talk about them. And your children surely are not. Life is fragile and generations pass. The years of our life, the psalmist said, three score and ten. Even by reason of strength, four score years. About 16 months ago when I was laying in ICU on a ventilator, I I was thinking about that verse. And in my prayer, as I was talking to the Lord, I I said, this is in your hand, but I did notice I didn't get my three score and ten. Not yet. It's not a promise. But the reality that's stated there is at best, at best, life is short. The psalmist went on to say that the years of our life are three score and ten, if by reason of strength, four score years, yet their span is but toil and trouble, and they are soon gone, and we fly away. So, I I, I will tell you, on the one hand, it seems like, wow, that was so long ago. On the other hand, it just seems like the snap of a finger and life has passed. And come now, you that say, today, Tomorrow, I'm going to go into such a city and buy and sell and make gain. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. And neither do I. Along the way in the journey of life, there are those signal moments as we look back when in a split second, it seemed, our lives turned upside down. Sometimes it was with the very thing we say, I never saw that coming. Sometimes it was with something that we did see coming. We just had no idea the impact and consequence and the reality that would follow when it came. But James said, The point of all of this is is not to lament life. To the contrary, the preacher is going to tell us, savor the moment. But be aware. There's a difference between savoring the moment and presuming on tomorrow. Don't assume. 
just because we're basking in the sunshine today, don't assume that tomorrow's weather is going to be exactly the same. Sometimes we enjoy the sunshine for a season, and sometimes the massive hurricane blows in. Life is fragile, folks. Life is precious and it's fragile. And it's too important for us to waste and and to waste opportunities of making the most of whatever time God is giving us right now. And, And I say that to say this. If there are unsaid things in your life that need to be said, get them said. If there are yet undone deeds that should have been taken care of a long time ago, get it done. If there are broken relationships that should have been healed long ago, for the sake of Christ, for the love of God, for the joy of reconciliation, Heal the relationship. Relationships are important, folks. It it, it may be that we go through moments in life when we think after after something has happened and we've been disappointed or or someone has wronged us or or our feelings have been royally hurt and we may convince ourselves, I don't need them, I don't need people, I don't need... I'll tell you what the writer of Ecclesiastes said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Life is full of weariness. He said, life is is hard. Life is hard, sometimes harder than others. Don't kid yourself into thinking that you can do this all by yourself. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, the preacher said that two are better than one. Why is that? It's because if one falls down, the other one can pick him up. If you're Superman or Superwoman and you never fall down, wonderful. But that's a delusion. You may say, well, I'll tell you one thing. I have made my decisions and my choices, and I will will take care of myself. Do you remember the other night when we were talking about things that are given to you, not things that you choose? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I am God's anointed one. I'm going to be the next king of Israel. Well, you may be, but I'll tell you right now, the present king of Israel is after your hide. 
And if he finds you, he's going to kill you. And you better run for your life, buddy. And so he did. David's life was an absolute roller coaster, spiritually. And it was a roller coaster emotionally. David not only had good moments, I mean, there were times in David's life he soared with the eagles. 17 years old and Goliath, are you kidding? What a day that must have been for him. What what joy, what excitement that that must have been only a few months later to be running for his life from the presence of the very king that he had faithfully served. And then, in his loneliness, in his separation, in his hiding, I don't know what you do when your life turns dark. I can, I, I can tell you, sometimes your life turns dark. You don't even know why it's turning dark. It just gets dark. One of the things they, they told me was that one of the consequences of some of the things I was about to go through would be <clears throat> some really dark days. If you've never been there, God bless you. I hope you never are. But if you've been there, you know. And there is the tendency when the lights go down, there is the tendency to withdraw. There is the tendency to hide. There is the tendency to detach. And where do you find David when his life went dark? He's hiding in the woods. You remember that? And thank God that's not the end of that story. Because there was someone in David's life, the friend who is closer than a brother. There is someone in David's, there was someone in David's life who went after him. I'm telling you, folks, of all the things you may appreciate about Jonathan and his love for David, you have to be on your knees thanking God that Jonathan sought David out. And when he found him, you know those words, they're beautiful. He strengthened his hand in God. Do you know why he did that? Because that's what God's children do. Do you know why they do that? Because that's the way love behaves. In 
in uh, uh, the second chapter of Mark's gospel, there's the narrative about a paralytic. Jesus, Capernaum, he's, he's teaching, he's performing miracles, he's in the house. And, and these four friends are, are bringing this quadriplegic to Jesus for healing. It's hard for us to imagine what that man's life must have been. 24-7, laying on a mat. Your back is hurting. Your back is sore. You're so tired of laying that way, you have to wait for someone to turn you. You can't turn yourself. You want a drink of water. You're so thirsty. You try not to think about it. As you're trying not to think about it, you're thinking about it more. You have to wait for someone to give you a drink. You, you hear news about this, this prophet, this, this rabbi, this teacher. He's come to town. He, there's excitement about this, and everyone is saying that he can heal the sick. He can give sight to the blind. And he can cause the lame to walk again. Wow. Wow. but he's laying on a mat. He can't move. He can't get there. But you know the story. He had four friends who could get there. And they carried his mat and took him to Jesus. When they got there, they couldn't even get in the door for the crowd, and they would not stop. They carried his mat to the rooftop, and they let him down in the presence of the Lord. And Jesus marveled at their faith. Wow. Now, if, if you, as you read that narrative, if you imagine yourself to be the noble one who's out there giving a hand to a stranger, you're helping the poor, you're, you're giving a bottle of water to the homeless. Oh, oh, oh. No. You're the one on the mat. I'm the one on the mat. And here's the question. In your life, in the realities of your experience, when the sunshine goes away, when the lights of your life are turned down low, when you find yourself in darkness, when you have become a recluse, when you are hiding in the woods, I'm asking you tonight, who carries your mat for you? Who does? And I'll just tell you tonight, I believe this to be true. Every one of us who by the grace of God will enter into the joy of of our Lord. We will be there 
in part because somebody or some bodies carried our mat during some of the darkest, most difficult, most trying days of our lives. Who carried your mat? We need one another. In this world, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In Romans, the eighth chapter, the Apostle Paul is acknowledging the reality of the struggles of life, of the difficulties that we face. The the Apostle Paul did not say, oh, you know, quit quit whining and crying about that. It's not that bad. I I want you to be really clear about this as it pertains to the pain and the suffering of life, and I'm not just talking about physical pain. I'm talking about brokenheartedness. God never said in his word, oh, it's not that bad. Get out. He never said that. He never said regarding the the trials and the tribulations that have plagued your life and your heart day after day for weeks or months or even years. He never said, oh, it's not that bad. Suffering is real in life under the sun. It's real. But, but, I consider, Paul said, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Wow. What are we going to say to all of this? Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also give us all things graciously? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Do do we understand that even this moment tonight, the Lord himself in heaven in the presence of God, our high priest, interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Folks, we may be in the darkness of the wood, deep in despair. But who's going to separate us from God's love? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. He didn't say it doesn't hurt sometimes. He didn't say that suffering's not real. He did not say that a broken heart is nothing to be crying about. Get over it. He did not say that. He said, 
In this world, you're going to have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And in Christ, we are more than conquerors. Sometimes, deep in the wood, in the darkness, and the pain, we really, really don't see the glory of God and His light. It is in that moment that in the deep recesses of your heart, that genuine abiding faith in Jesus, the Son of God, you find your hope and your strength. And if by the grace of God, the one who has carried your mat comes to your side in that wood and strengthens your hand in God. You praise God for that blessing. And you reciprocate that kind of love to others. But there come a moment, there comes a moment in life when we find ourselves in the darkness of the room, in those long, arduous moments with nothing but the sound of the ventilator as it is pumping. when you really begin to realize that when this thing called life has reached its end, God knows when that moment will be. But when that moment comes, no matter how much others love you, no matter how wonderful that marriage has been, no matter how genuine the affection from those children and grandchildren, there comes a moment when we find ourselves alone with God. And in that moment, we come to understand not only that Jesus is our hope. But brothers and sisters, we find ourselves understanding in that moment, Jesus is enough. He's enough. And everything he promised and everything he said It's true, and it's enough. And if our days on this earth are three score and ten, or if they're four score years, if they're months or days, The hope we have is founded on the love of God that was expressed in the incarnation of His Son, Christ Jesus. We plant our feet firmly on that conviction 
that he is the Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, Savior and King. And we long for the day when the gates will open and God will receive us. And we are in his presence with all those who have loved his appearing. What a day that's going to be. I wasn't sure a few months ago if I would be here tonight. But I'll tell you this. I was sure that here or there, by the grace of God, his people are going to be together again. What a day of rejoicing that will be. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, we ask you tonight to give serious consideration to your relationship to God. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, we're asking you tonight to act on that conviction by yielding your life in obedience to him. If you've never submitted to the Lord in baptism with a penitent heart, you can do that this very night. If you're sitting here tonight as a Christian, And someone has turned the lights out. And rather than basking in the sunshine and the glory of the love of the Lord, you are struggling immensely to find that hope and peace. I have the privilege tonight of being the one to tell you that hope and peace is found in the Lord. I'm asking you tonight to come home. When we stand and sing, we invite you to come.